So we're very pleased to welcome again Dr. Anne Bertolog tonight for a lecture organized by LGML, Literature, Modern Language and Drawings of Pont de Malazan University, in combination with our class on fantasy literature. This is the third time that Dr. Bertolog honored her with her presence. Dr. Anne Bertolog teaches French medieval literature from a comparative point of view at the University of Connecticut. This is where I got my PhD. She was my professor, in fact, since 1999. Not she was not my professor since 1999, but she began there to work in 1999. Why do I say that? Anyway, she has a doctoral final degree. She's in a final degree, right? So there's nothing more for her after that. She has a doctoral degree from the Parisian University of La Sorbonne, where she wrote her dissertation on, quote, the Enchanter and the book, or Merlin, between knowledge and wisdom. She has contributed to the publication of more than 30 academic books and written more than 120 articles in different academic reviews, plus present more than 150 papers. Nice, right? <laughs> During international conference. She has recently published a book on La Légende d'Arthur, the Arthur legend, and is working on a book about magic and fantasy literature with a certain doctoralist card. She just signed also a contract for a 400-page special volume on Merlin in the collection Great Mythic Figures. This book should be published in 2012. Here is an example of one of the books. I think I love that book, The Legend, La Légende du Roi d'Arthur, here, that she published in French. It's a, we call that a tea table book. Uh, this book is really great because it's one of the first books where instead of using Raphaelite's 19th century picture or painting of the King Arthur legend, this, is, this used the Middle Age manuscript blue engravings and aluminium. So it's really a unique book that is really beautiful. You can have a look to it. It's in French, I'm sorry. But she is translated in Korean, in Japanese, in Chi Chinese, right? Yes, but not this one. Not this one, not yet. <laughs> Anybody would like to translate in Chinese, please raise your hand right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Dr. Bertolo is also the chief editor of the exclusive Arthurian Merlin Review, Les Plumois. She is one of the founding members and the actual secretary treasurer of the International Society of Merlin's Friends. So if you are a friend with Merlin, mm -hmm, there is the person. So, to paraphrase Anne Rice's famous 1976 novel, tonight we are treated not with an interview with a vampire, but with an interview with a dragon. So, dragon there be, please join me in welcoming Professor Anne Bertolo. Okay, so we are going to speak about dragons because dragons are among the creatures that figure in almost all fantasy books. I mean, n not having a dragon in a fantasy novel is really be lacking in consideration of the reader. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, we have here two books um, on dragons. The first one is Dragons of Fantasy, and it studies which is called Dragon Law 101 and Dragon Law 102. So it teaches you everything you want to know about how to write a dragon story or how to put a dragon in a novel. But there are also very interesting studies about several fantasy writers, among them Tolkien and Le Guin and so on, who have indeed created interesting dragons. And this one is a more recent book it just came out actually and it has been written by two scholars. One is a Western scholar in Germany, Thomas Honegger, and the other one is a Chinese scholar, Fan Chen Chen, and he in fact is working at the same university as Professor Honegger and they decided to compare dragons, Eastern and Western dragons, which are absolutely not the same kind of creatures. The one in the back is the Western dragon. The one in the front is the Eastern dragon. By the way, when you go online and you search on summerland.org and you just ask for images of dragons, and you get 
3,170,000 results. Pictures of dragons, all kinds of dragons. So here we have a number of types of Western dragons. You have also the reference for the book of Onega. And you can see that mostly Western dragons have evolved from something looking more or less like a snake then a lizard, then you had a number of spikes around, then later you had wings. Most western dragons, as you can see starting with the D one, do have wings, which is a big difference with eastern dragons. Eastern dragons do fly, but without wings, apparently. Here are eastern dragons. Basically, these are snakes who have grown paws or claws. In fact, there is a legend in China that says that when a snake becomes older after the 500 years of his life, he becomes a dragon. He grows claws. And he's not a snake anymore, but he's a kind of lizard. Also, eastern dragons have horns, and they have some kind of whiskers, like a cat. In fact, the long, which is the word for dragon, more or less, in China, is an hybrid. And here is from... Um, the article, the entry on dragons, Shi Long, explaining dragons by Luo Song in the 13th century, the elements that compose a dragon. Uh, an eastern dragon has horns like a deer's, a head like a camel's, eyes like a rabbit, a neck like a snake's, an abdomen like a clam's, sorry, Scales like fishes, talons like an ox, palms like a tiger's, and heels like a buffalo. Supposedly, you can find these elements in these animals, although this one is a Japanese dragon. It's a Ryukyu. The other big difference between Eastern and Western dragons is that Western dragons have rather bad press. Usually, they are the bad characters in a story. And the hero gets his glory by fighting the dragon. If possible, killing the dragon. In fact, most good dragons in the Western world are dead dragons. On the other hand, in the Eastern world, the dragon is a beneficent creature. When you get a dragon as a friend, it's probably the sign that you will be happy and lucky. So Eastern dragons are really positive creatures, most of them. Um, in the last two centuries, there's been some cross-cultural mixing of dragons, which means that you will now find Chinese and Japanese dragons that are maleficent and that are negative characters. Also, some Eastern dragons are, in fact, shapeshifters. So that they can, and we'll see that it's not only the Eastern dragons, but when dragons transform into human beings, it's usually not out of the goodness of their hearts. Now we'll try to see what kind of influences modern Western dragons, the one you will study and you will encounter in your fantasy novels are done with. The antique world had a lot of dragons. One of the first one was this one, Ladon, called in Greek Dracon Ladon, or Dracon Esperios too, because he was supposed to be the keeper of the apples 
in the Esperides garden. Uh, his name, its name means dragon strong flow, which suggests that it was probably originally a water dragon. He is the son of Cato and Phorcus, as Hesiod, the Greek poet, said in the Theogony. And mean, well, Cato and Phorcus are water monsters. They are also creatures with a number of arms or legs or tails. It's an immortal serpent, of course, but in some representation it has a number of heads, which will be the problem of most antique serpents, dragons or snakes. Here you have the fight between Hercules and Ladon, and of course Hercules is supposed to get the apples of the tree in the Garden of the Hesperides. I beg you to remember this picture you will see later that this dragon has some kind of strange descendants later. This is a very modern rendition of the same dragon. As you can see, it has a number of heads. The second kind of classical antique dragon is the one keeping the spring of Ares. And he was killed by Cadmus, who was a Greek hero, and then the goddess Athene, in fact, told Cadmus to pull out the teeth of the dragon and to sow them. This created a new breed of men called the Spartoi, in other words, the sown men, precisely, which immediately started killing each other because they were fierce and wild, as the dragon was. But the five survivors founded the city of Thebes in Greece, and they were, <coughs> they were supposed to be absolutely fierce warriors which means that one of the most uh, mythical people of the antique world were supposed to be the sons of dragon. The third one, third antique one, is the dragon keeping the golden fleece. Again, this creature is cast in the role of a keeper a guardian. This will be a constant after that. Dragons are supposed to keep treasures or to hold treasures and be very protective of their treasures. We, you will see that especially with the dragon smog in The Hobbit. Now the Bible has also a number of dragons. It's a little more difficult. The first one, of course, the very famous one, is Leviathan, the dragon of the sea. And you find a, a reference to him in Isaiah. In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish the Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So this is a 19th century representation of the Leviathan. And it is a dragon, indeed, with scales, with wings, with everything. Except that in Hebrew, uh, it seems that Leviathan means only whale. And you do have here, on the right, a somewhat more ancient, it's a um, miniature of the 12th century, representation of the Leviathan, and it is indeed a big fish. So it's not exactly the classical idea of a dragon. You have a small dragon on the, on the left. Um, it's supposed to be a griffin, actually. 
And then, of course, you have the serpent or the snake in the Garden of Eden, which is not very serious. I mean, a serpent, a snake, well, it's not that impressive. So it will morph in the imaginary of the Christian and the Jews as a real dragon. As you can see in this painting, um, the dragon or the snake looks like a woman. And looks, in some painting it's more evident that, that in this one, looks very much like Eve, which seems to suggest that there is a connection between the evil serpent and the woman from the very beginning. Remember, you have an apple tree. You have an apple tree, which seems to suggest that the antique laden, the keeper of the Hesperides apples, is not that far removed of the snake in the Garden of Eden. Of course, the snake became a serpent, became a dragon, and became the dragon, became Satan. Features mainly in Revelations, where it is very clearly said that it has seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on the head, which makes sense. Here we have a 13th century representation of the Armageddon fight with the angels led by St. Michael on the left and the dragon. So you can count the seven heads. There are no horns and there are no diadems. It's difficult to represent this kind of thing you see that the head of the dragons is in fact very close to the head of a serpent, more or less. Now, the Middle Ages. We inherit in the Middle Ages a mix between the antique dragon and the biblical dragon. And what do you do with a dragon in the Middle Ages? Well, actually, there are less dragons there than you would think. When you start studying medieval literature, you think that you will find a dragon every page. You don't. What you find, on the other hand, are giants. And some of the giants do have dragons as pets. A dragon is the cat or the dog of a giant which means that usually you first kill the dragons and then you go on killing the giant, who is pissed off because you did kill his pet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one area where you find a lot of dragons is a geography. The leaves of the saints are full of dragons. Because you have the male saints who tend to kill dragons, and then you have the female sense who do tame dragons. Killing first. St. Michael, of course, is the most famous one. You find very numerous representation of St. Michael killing the dragons. And the more you see these representations, the sadder you feel about the dragon. Because usually this poor creature, look, look at the one on the left, he is absolutely, he, he does not understand what's happening to him, and he's absolutely not responsible. It's just that the saint wants to get the glory, mainly. I insist on you looking at that. Here is a winged dragon killed by St. Michael in flight. Of course, this is Mount St. Michael in Normandy, where, of course, the patron saint was St. Michael. 
And in fact, he wanted the mount, the abbey on the mount, built in memory of his fighting the dragon, and he said so in a dream to the abbot, and the abbot was not living at the mount at the time, and the abbot was absolutely not happy with this idea, so it took St. Michael three tries before he convinced the abbot to build this new abbey. And you have a lot of statues and representation of St. Michael killing the dragon. The other one, the other great saint, dragon killer saint, is St. George. St. George, as you can see, is killing a dragon who was supposed to come and eat a, a princess, which, if you think about it, is the exact reproduction of the story of Persea, Perseus and Andromedus, which is an antique story and a mythical story about the hero, the half-god, son of Zeus, Perseus, killing a dragon. Most Olympian gods and their numerous progeny had to kill the monster, the monsters who were the first generation of the gods. When at first the world was created, it was very close to chaos yet, which meant that you had a number of bizarre creatures. For instance, the Ekatonchirus, giants with 100 arms, dragons, 100 headed dragons, or like the Lernian Hydra, dragons whose heads grew up every time you tried to kill, to cut off one. Every time you cut one head, two grow in that place, which makes the killing of the animal very difficult, especially since the Hydra has one immortal head. All the other ones can be killed, except that they keep reproducing, but there is one immortal head. You don't know which one it is. So imagine the function of Hercules trying to cut off all the heads, including the immortal one. So St. George is in fact a perfect copy. We were, you were talking of plagiarism a little earlier. You can say that St. George is plagiarizing Perseus. It's exactly the same story, except that the princess of Trebizond, when she has been freed by St. George, converted to Christianism. Since at that time, this is a painting of the 15th century by the Venetian painter Uccello, uh, sorry, Carpaccio, uh, the dragon was supposed to represent the devil, to represent Satan. Now, taming the dragon, you have a nice little dragon leashed by St. Margaret, who apparently was leading her dragon through the streets um, with a leash do uh, made out of her belt, which was very pretty. Um, usually, nevertheless, you couldn't keep a dragon, even a tamed one, for a long time, so Ma St. Margaret drove the dragon to the river where it drowned. And now Melusine, it's not exactly a matter of a geography. I didn't know where to put it. So that's why it's here, but it's not really. It's very important. Melusine is a fairy. It's, it, she is a medieval fairy. And she's a very beneficent fairy, apparently. She meets a knight close to a fountain. She helps him out of a big problem. He has inadvertently killed his lord and uncle during a hunt. So she helps him hide that little detail. 
he becomes a count of the area. And she is ready to help him to build castles. Melusin is a builder. She builds dozens of castles and she ensures the prosperity of the family of Lusignan. Except that she made him, she made the man she married, promise that he will never try to see her on the Saturday night. She promises that she will do nothing contrary to his honor. She will not betray him. She will not see a lover. But she does not want him to see her. This is the kind of gaze in the Celtic world of taboo. You don't see the lady one day of the, of the week or when she is uh, giving birth or something like that. And after a number of years, the brother of the knight tells him that, of course, his wife is deceiving him and so on. So he spies on her on a Saturday night. And here is what he sees. Melusine is a half dragon. Or rather, she is a serpent, a she snake. She is under a curse. She is a fairy, and she has been cursed by her own mother. That's complicated. But what she wants is to live her life out as a human woman. She wants to marry. She wants to give birth to children. And she wants to die as a human woman and as, in fact, a good Christian. Because if she does that, she will acquire a soul. Fairies don't have soul. Remember uh, the small mermaid. And she desperately wants one. So on a Saturday night, she reversed to her fairy nature, to her animal nature. And she appears as more or less a dragon. Actually, the texts say that at that stage, she has a fish tail as big as a barrel, a herring barrel, to be precise. But her husband is sorry. He thinks that after all, she's doing nothing bad. She is just bathing. And that's not a big problem to have a wife who transforms into a snake on a Saturday night, as long as she does not do anything else. The problem is she has given birth to 10 sons. And all of them have some kind of physical defect. One has free eyes. One has a lion claw getting out of his cheek. One has two big boar teeth out of his mouth, and so on. And one of them is a very um, angry character when he learns that the only normal son has decided to become a monk. Since he's not happy with that, he burns the abbey where his brother is a monk with all the monks and his brother. And when the father learns that, he is so furious that he turns against his wife, which of course makes sense, and he said, you cursed serpent. And so it, it has come, become public. So she has to go away. And she does so in transforming into a dragon, a full dragon. So you see that. This is a very famous manuscript, the Très Riche Zeur of the Duke of Berry. And he chose on the calendar the different castles of the Duke. One of them is the castle of Lusignan. And it says that three days before one of the heirs of Lusignan is going to die, the serpent, 
Melusine comes and flies around the towers, crying piteously. So here you see the little serpent over there, and a little bigger here, it's not very good. But remember, it looks very much like the Satan dragon killed by St. Michael. And here you have a very late representation of Melusine, which is not the dragon anymore, but which is a mermaid, with two fish tail, actually. When we are not in a geography in the Middle Ages, we are in romances with heroes. And what does a hero do to prove he is a hero? He kills dragons. Of course. What, what, what can you do with a dragon? Although, actually, a number of knights happen to meet lady dragons. And the knight is quite ready to go and kill the monster. And the monster humbles herself in front of him and just wants to kiss the knight. This is what's called the fierce kiss, le fier baiser. And usually the knight is horrified. He thinks he's going to hell immediately because he has been kissed by a monster. And the female dragon kisses him, and she rushes away. And what does happen, do you think? Remember, what happens when you kiss a frog? Yeah, the, the she-dragon transforms back into a beautiful princess, which usually uh, allows the knight to marry the princess, and everything is has a very happy ending. But sometimes you do have a number of dragons that get killed. Uh, there is one, the first one, historically, chronologically, is the dragon of Beowulf. Unfortunately, there are no representations of the dragon of Beowulf. Yes, there, there is a recent movie about that, but it's not exactly what you could expect. So no, it's not. It doesn't work. Uh, yeah, well, OK. <laughs> but it's a somewhat <clears throat> apocryphal interpretation of Beowulf, maybe. So, and the only, the unique manuscript of Beowulf is much too old to have any miniature. So you cannot have any representation of Grendel or her, his mother or the dragon in the manuscript of Beowulf. Actually, this one is a very late representation, as you can see, it's 1910. But it's the story of the Völsung, or maybe you know them better, uh, with the Nibelungen lead and the opera by Wagner. The, sto the basic story regarding a dragon is that one Dwarf got a treasure. I will go over the details. And to protect the treasure, after first killing his brother, to be the only one to keep it, he transforms into a dragon. And of course, Sigurd comes by, and he has been raised to kill the dragons. He not only kills Fafnir, it's not quite clear, but it, he cuts out his heart and eats it, which will not give him courage, he has that already, but will give him knowledge, and especially the knowledge of understanding all animals, languages, speeches. So the dragon is the wisest animal. Even though he is a beast, a monster, he is also famous for his wisdom. There is also an other 
more allegorical dragon killed by the Red Cross Knight in The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. But this is more an allegory of Christianity killing the devil. And again, you have the same kind of image that you will find for St. Michael and the dragon. And again, you rather feel some sympathy for the dragon. And of course, we are entering more modern times with Tolkien, and especially his representation of a big dragon, one of the first dragons, Glorung, who is killed by Turin Turandar. And the story is told in The Children of Urin, who came out a few, two or three years ago, and was found in Tolkien's papers. Classical dragon, he does not have wings, but he is a flaming dragon, a fire-breathing dragon. He has red eyes, and Glorung is one of the first dragons about which it is told that you must never look a dragon into the eye because he will deceive you and he will seduce you and whatever. And you have the scales, and you can see that Turin Turambar is much smaller. Dragons have been getting bigger and bigger for the ages. And now we are going to enter the time of dragon, modern dragons, modern and postmoderns. Um, not only because they are very recent, some of them, but because they are very postmodern dragons, at least a few of them, deconstructing the usual image of dragons and so on. This one, for instance. The Reluctant Dragon. It was a story written by Kenneth Graham in 1898. And this was the first time you had a dragon who didn't want to kill people or eat people or do whatever a dragon does normally. He wanted to collect poetry, to read books, and to have tea and cakes with the people of his village, which of course was a little difficult. But eventually he did manage it. What is important here is in order to have a reluctant dragon, you need to have already a very clear idea of what a dragon is. To have a parody of a dragon, you must first have an archetype of dragon. At that point, in 1898, at the end of the 19th century, the image of the dragon is fixed. When you say dragon, everybody knows what it is. And you know, for instance, that dragons don't like poetry, normally. Another version of a very surprising dragon is the one described by Evelyn Nesbitt, who was one of the first writers to capitalize on the taste for dragons. People love dragons, wanted dragons everywhere. So she wrote the book of dragons with a number of short stories in it. <laughs> One of them, the Dragon Tamers, tells a story of a not too bright dragon who gets deceived by two fearless dragon hunters that are not fearless, but who in fact managed to make the dragon understand that it would be much more comfortable to be a cat. And the dragons, in the end, transforms into a cat. He becomes a pussycat. And instead of eating flesh and everything, he just eats milk, or drinks milk, and eats mice, if they found them, and he's a very nice creature, purring and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I, 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 will, I will try to remember. No, I don't. I never read this story to my cats. <laughs> Better to be prudent sometimes. Um, here, you will we'll go very quickly on this, because, of course, there is smog, the big hole of smog with the arc and stone. You will learn more about that later if you don't know what it is. But on the left, you have an other Tolkien dragon, which, of course, is interesting because it's a story called The Former Giles of Ham, and it's more like a parody of all the big stories by Tolkien. And this one, Chrysophylax Dewes, which means the rich keeper of gold in Greek. He has a very, very um, famous and noble name. Is more in the line of the reluctant dragon. He does not really want to mess with human beings. He basically wants to be left alone. And the former Giles of Ham is a very improbable hero. So in the end, there is some kind of uneasy truth between the humans and the dragon. While, of course, poor Smog gets killed at the end of The Hobbit. Not quite at the end. He is not even part of the last destruction, the last battle. In the 1960s, a science fiction and fantasy writer, science fiction mainly, Anne McCaffrey, and by the way, yes, Ursula Le Guin was a, one of the first women to write fantasy in a world of men writers, except that now a new fantasy is written at 80% by women. So the proportion has reversed. Even in science fiction, you do have a few writers. But So Anne McCaffrey started writing, which is called as the Pern Saga, to answer the question, what if the dragons were the good guys? That's a question she asked. And she created the dragons of Pern. Pern is a planet somewhere very far. I used to know exactly where it is, but I've forgotten. And people from a very advanced technological civilization want to revert to a more agrarian, medieval, in effect, way of life. So they come to the planet Pern in order to forget everything about technology, except that they discover 60 years, no, 20 years after they first arrived, that there is a threat coming every 200 years, some kind of a comet or wandering star or whatever, comes and there are terrible threads that fall on the planet and destroy every life. So. They discovered, too, that there is a small creature looking like an overgrown lizard with wings and behaving basically like a cat again. The fire dragons are able to breathe fire, and they are the only one able to destroy threads by burning them out. And also, they are able to teleport in some kind of a void place to go from one place to another through the void called the interstice. So, since still, the colonists still have something of that technology, they decide to bioengineer big animals from the fire lizard. And they do that. They have brought horses and so, 
And the first dragon they create, the first generation, is Karenath here. Karenath, as you can see, is more or less the same size as a horse, a big horse, admittedly. They have wings, but look at their head. These are not exactly the kind of head you find among dragons, usually. They are rounded animals with big, jewel-faceted eyes, and they are very sweet. They are very, very, very nice, the dragons. And when the real story of the first volume, Dragon Flight and Dragon Quest, start, a number of centuries have passed, and you have the big dragons of modern times. Green, blue, brown, bronze, and golden. Only the green and the golden are females, and only the golden can lay eggs. So it's very rare to have a queen dragon, a golden one, and she is the only one that lay clutches and that reproduce the breed of dragons. The green dragons are just there for the relief of the other male, the blue and brown males, as it's so nicely put. These dragons have one very special characteristic. They get impressed. It means they bound with one special human. When the, the eggs are hatching, young men and women, I mean, of course, the girls are here only for the queen dragon because women are not fighters in this very conservative society normally. The teenagers are there, and the dragon, each dragon chooses his or her partner for life. And they are bound by a telepathic bond. They can talk to each other in their minds, and the bond is absolutely forever. It cannot be broken. When a knight, dragon knight, dies, his dragon commits suicide. And when a dragon dies, the human does not commit suicide, not always at least, which is supposed to be a progress, but he is almost unable to survive and is deeply depressed and so on. This not only shows that dragons can be nice, can be the good guys, but it's the first time that you see this link between a human being and a dragon. And uh, Anne McCaffrey puts it very clearly. Who would not want to have as his or her best friend forever a dragon? Who will help you, who will defend you, who will trust you, and who will always tell you that you are the most beautiful, the wisest, the most intelligent, the best person ever. That's very satisfactory, especially for teenagers. <laughs> Which means that it's exactly what happens in Aragon. Uh, Safira is, in fact, well, again, a case of plagiarism of the Pern Dragons by Chris Paolini. Safira is very close to Ramoth the Golden, the Queen Dragon in Dragonflight. <coughs> Safira is, again, one of these dragons who hatches when there is a suitable rider close to her whether she 
is right in choosing Aragon as a suitable rider is another question. But it's the same kind of dragon. It's a positive creature. It's not a monster anyone, anymore. The, the monster, there are a lot of them, but not Sapphira. And even if some dragons are supposed to have become monsters, it's not their fault. The fault is Galbatorix. It's not the dragon. Ursula Le Guin has, of course, a number of dragons in Earthseas. And it's very interesting because she wrote five installments of the Earthsea series. And they're all dragons from the first one on. But apparently, her vision of dragons did change over the years. At the beginning, the dragons, some like Yevod in uh, The Wizard of Earthsea, is not exactly a sympathetic character. He is threatening and um, Jed, the main character, only reaches a truce with him because he knows the dragon's real name and he can get power on him because of that. But then, later, we meet other dragons, more articulate dragons, who explain a lot of things, especially the dragon Kalesin. And in the last installment, the other win, it is clearly explained that in fact, dragons and humans are descended from a common ancestor. And that you might say that the human beings are failed dragons. There are those who did not make the right choice. It seems that mankind is a um, second tier citizen compared to the dragons. But also, in these books, dragons can take a human form, and humans can transform into dragons, because basically they are all one and the same. And especially Tihanu, the main character of the fourth book, who has been abused as a child and who, is, who bears terrible scars and so on, in the fifth volume transforms into a dragon. And she is freed of her scars and of her traumatisms because she becomes a dragon. It's, in fact, the fashion in fantasy to have a lot of dragons that can become human beings and vice versa. Especially in Barbara Ambley, Winterlands, where you have a dragon bane, a fearless hunter of dragons, expect except that he is not interested in killing dragons. What he wants to do is to study dragons and to know exactly how they think and where they come from and so on. And you have also a witch who is supposed to kill the dragons, but who in fact discover that the dragons are not the criminals. The criminals are other creatures or the witches. And she becomes a powerful witch thanks to more Caleb the Black that you have here on these two covers. More Caleb the Black who gives Jenny the gift of becoming a dragon. She becomes a dragon. And then, because of her love for her husband, her children, and so on, she chooses to go back to her humanity. She chooses to renounce being a dragon. But that's a choice. And she keeps the ability of becoming a dragon if she really wants. And Mokaleb becomes more and more human. He is very close 
to humanity at the end. And then you have two other examples, Elven Bane and the Dragon Vald trilogy, where humans and dragons can morph into each other and do so, so on a regular basis. In Elven Bane, in fact, there is a human child who is adopted by dragons. She is, in fact, a half elf, and elf in these stories are the bad ones. These are not elves as in Tolkien, these are really the bad guys. But Lashana is raised with her brother, dragon, and she is very unhappy as a child because she is not able to take over her other form. She is not able to become a dragon. And her adoptive mother is very surprised too, and her adoptive brother too, because they wonder, why doesn't she transform? And eventually, one discovers that among the resistant humans, the leaders of the resistance are all dragons who have taken a human form because it's much more practical to do a number of things. Dragons don't have hands, for instance. They are not used to talk in understandable voices and so on. Again, dragon and man are not separated anymore. Same thing in the Dragon Vault trilogy. You can become a dragon, or rather, a dragon can become a human being in two ways, either by white magic, which is very uncomfortable for the dragon, or by blood magic, which is quite pleasant for the dragon since he gets to eat the human whose form it takes. There is no borders anymore between humanity and dragoninity, in effect. The dragon has become so seducive, so attractive, that the desire of people, of men, women, is to become a dragon, to be a real dragon. It's not always the case, however, and I want to mention one or two last series. Um, the Temerar series, again, play on the fact that these dragons, as in they are a great number of types and spatials of dragons, eastern ones and western ones and so on. And again, they work, they are used as weapons during some kind of parallel world, Napoleonic wars, and they are bonded with one special human. This is the big Anne McCaffrey innovation. You have a one-to-one -one relationship between a human being and a dragon. You may know about Terry Pratchett Discworld. You don't have the time to read that, and I don't have the time to enter the details. Of course, Terry Pratchett takes everything that has been written in fantasy before him, and he puts it together in his Discworld stories. So you have a complete typology of all the dragons. I didn't put all of them. There is also a water dragon, and uh, I cut a number of mentions about the um, nobilis, Draco nobilis, and Draco swan dragons. Uh, the Draco nobilis is, in fact, the produce of imagination. It's only because of the magic of imagination that you can have a dragon nobilis materializing in the disc world. The swam dragon is a nuisance, a pest, 
uh, living in the swamps, and some people use them as pets. And eventually, the last step is you just make the dragons the main and only characters of the story. <laughs>